And I've always said in, in business, uh, learning from one of my mentors that says, you can't expect what you are not able to inspect. Hi, I'm Wyatt. And I'm Grace. And you're listening to Our Dad and your host of the Vacation Rental Revolution podcast. What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Vacation Rental Revolution podcast. I'm your host, Sean Moore, and I'm here with our Friday interviews with short-term rental investor, Mr. Drew Griffin. So, Drew, thanks for joining me. These are my favorite conversations where we get to dive into the nav and navigating the journey and lessons learned in diving into the short-term rental game. So, thanks so much for joining us, Drew. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate the invite. Uh, really glad to be here. Uh, glad to be part of the Vodacy uh, Network and looking forward to the conversation. Awesome. Likewise, I, I love these conversations because that's just what they are. You and I are we're going to catch up a little bit, and everybody's listening in, right? And so, it's uh, it, it's really fun. As a start to all of these episodes, is I always love to get the backstory of what do you do for a living? What you know? What kind of real estate experience do you have? What got you interested in short term rentals? Because everybody's journey is a little bit different, and I always love to start with getting to know a little bit about you, your background, kind of what what led you to navigating into the short-term rental game? Yeah, I appreciate the, the opportunity. Like I said, uh, for me, it all started, I mean, if I look back on it, it's, it would be hard to depict to this as the beginning of the story. But the more I look at it, it really is the start. It's uh, when I was 23, coming out of college, not having a clue what I'm doing, you know, where I'm going. Uh, I unfortunately lost my father. And that was a very formative experience for me that sort of set me on this process of, you know, a lot of people say that your life sometimes doesn't start until uh, you lose your, you know, your father from a, from a, a, a man's perspective, you don't become your own man uh, a lot of times. And so I just was forced to sort of grow up faster uh, than maybe I had wanted to or expected and went towards opportunity, moved to Washington, D.C., uh, doing some some work uh, in the government contracting space, leveraging my finance degree from uh, East Carolina University. You can see on my on my shirt. Um, and, and what happened there was when I moved to DC, got a job. You know, kind of did the normal nine to five thing, and met a, a girl that's now my wife, and really started having some strategic heart to heart conversations with his, her father who had done real estate in Old Town, Alexandria, uh, just outside of Washington, D.C., back in the 70s and 80s. And we had this sort of philosophical tug of war for a few years where I was always talking about fixed income, you know, uh, having the safe approach, you know, because I had just gone through this experience of losing my father. And uh, I grew up, my dad was a preacher mom teacher and so we maximized you know what we had resource wise but it wasn't a lot of leftovers if, if you will and so my father-in-law was just instrumental in helping me sort of lift off that aspect of being not scared but sort of timid and that he had you know signed million dollar loans with 18 19 percent interest back in the 70s and he's laughing at me because i'm like uh, I got this 4% loan. I don't know if I can handle it. And so over time, it, it really got me in that idea of like, man, real estate really is a captivating sector to, to consider that I had no experience in. And so I'd say that sort of started the process uh, to where we are today. But that was back in 2013, 14. And it's taken many years to get to this space. Yeah. And it's interesting how you know, our perspective starts to change by, I always say there, you know, power and proximity, right? Being around other people who have a different perspective and really surrounding yourself with people that are doing maybe different things than, or, you know, things that we want to do. And, you know, that was a relationship that was, you know, it's a family relationship. So like you said, you kind of had this back and forth for a couple of years of, Hey, what's better, right? What's, what's the, where, where's the pros and cons of each of those types of, approaches to financial freedom and independence and everything else. And um, it's interesting and it's, it is nice because it's somebody you can trust, right? right. It's your, it, it's your wife's father. So you feel like, okay, he's giving me the best advice. It's not somebody like a guy like me online where you're like, I don't know if I can trust him or if I can't trust him because I just hear everybody talking, right? Or especially in today's day and age where there's so much noise out there. It's nice when you, you're able to talk to somebody that was able to navigate 
high interest rates, different, you know, different environments that, you know, like you said, we complain about the the rates where they're at right now. And they, they were nothing like they were in the late seventies, right? right. Early eighties. Right. And, um, and we realized, oh, there's, there's ways to navigate this stuff. And so it kind of opens your eyes. What, what originally, so that was real estate in general. I'm sure he wasn't probably doing short-term rental <laughs> investing, but he, you know, real estate as an asset class has a lot of different lanes you can run down. So, what, you know, a decade later, you kind of started saying, hey, maybe I like real estate. You started to look probably on my guesses, looking at different asset classes along the way and kind of uh, evaluating what led you to short term rentals particularly. Yeah, great question. So, yeah, and that, this even goes back to when we bought our primary house in 2014, back in the really low interest rate range. Had didn't even know it, but at the time, if I hadn't bought that house and my wife and I are still there, you know, as the income you know kind of grew and we started getting more experience and more opportunities we never left that house we've kept the same uh low interest rate environment ever since and it allowed me to sort of have the ability to create a heloc a home equity line of credit and sort of have that lever to pull when i got in a position of feeling like i'm going to do this and so what happened was two years ago i got into a situation where um I was in a business uh, relationship. The person at the time, he was the majority owner. He separated you know, out of nowhere and, and basically, you know, flipped me on my head. Right. And I got to figure out what's the next thing. And one of the biggest things that really drove me is the fact that I didn't have control over my own destiny or my own outcomes. Um, and not, not to say there's anything wrong with being a W2 environment. I'm currently in one as well, but I knew I need to create other protection aspects to, you know, help my family grow, help me grow, help have a legacy for the family. So I got really, I'd say, motivated in late 2022 as I'm working through that business relationship ending and finding a new one and that I need to get into real estate. I need to be serious about it. I need to be intentional. And so my mindset was I'm going to get involved in sh in short-term investments from a flipping standpoint okay. and so i make an investment uh into a program that it was going to have me doing uh three to four month flips and then i started thinking well wait a second if i do that i'm exposed to a lot of short-term capital gains you know, you know if you buy and sell rather quickly under a year you get exposed to a lot of uh, taxes that i want to avoid so then i thought well, wait a second I'm learning in the industry about this bonus depreciation. I'm learning about cost segregations. I'm learning about short-term rental loopholes, you know, seven days or less on average stays, how that creates active income. And I started thinking, wait, I got to flip this. My short-term uh, vacation rentals should be my long-term approach. And my yeah. short-term uh, fix and flips would be more of a, uh, sh a, a longer play, but not, it should, it shouldn't be where I'm focused. Like my, my like hold and my buying holds is really a, a short term thing in a sense. And it's weird because it kind of flips the, the, uh, the trajectory, but I got introduced to Vodacy in October of 2023. Started listening to the podcast, started kind of like poking around. I think it was you and Dave on one of the, uh, you know, Facebook ads or Instagram ads is kind of talking about the five year approach to uh, finding financial freedom What really pierced through, I think from the noise that you, that you alluded to earlier is I'm not a very, uh, I'd say fast paced person in terms of making strategic decisions. I like to chew on it, sort of circle around. I've run marathons through my life. So I'm, very comfortable in settling into like a long-term you know, strategy. You guys mentioned a five-year, you know, trend, uh, trajectory. It wasn't like in two months you will, you know, double, triple, quadruple your income and, and you'll never have to work another day in your life. And it's like, that doesn't compute for me of someone who likes to stack things really kind of like yeah. slowly and slowly. So when I heard your message on like, this is going to take time. It's going to take hard work. It's going to take this, that, and the other. It felt more genuine. It felt more um, legitimate, if you will. And so I reached out um, and I was uh, doing some work with helping my mother 
down in Asheville, North Carolina, and I talked to Paul Farina or Farino on, on your on the team, and we just hit it off. Had a really good conversation about you know the the program, and uh, I knew, you know what, I'm gonna accelerate my learning curve, protect against some of the downside uh, if I make the investment now into the program and not have to do the whole school of hard knocks and figure it all out. I'm sure I can, but do I want to do that over a five year period versus maybe I can squeeze this down into a five month period of learning that is. Yeah, that's awesome. And it's, it's always, I love hearing what got people interested in it. And sometimes it's, you know, Hey, we went and stayed in a vacation rental and we were on vacation and I realized how much I paid and we're like, man, this is, this is, this might be a lucrative asset class. Other times, you kind of fell into it by looking at a different a different route with real estate, which is fix and flip, and realizing, holy crap, I'm I'm going to work really hard to make a lot of money, and I'm paying active income taxes on this these fix and flips, which is a lot. You know, right. you, you know, depending on the, the tax bracket, it's going to be somewhere close to forty to fifty percent, right? And so you're like, whoa, maybe I don't want to do that. But that's interesting that that led you to discovering the conversations about bonus depreciation and the short-term rental loophole. And then all of a sudden you start looking into it and start saying, Hey, maybe I like this asset class. And I do, I love that you brought up the fact that we talk about it being still a long-term play, yeah. right? A long-term in my opinion is, you know, three, five, 10 years, right? This is not, this is not, Hey, let's go get rich quick today. Let's go quit our jobs tomorrow. And everything's very, everything's great. That's not the way we, we play the game. And, and that's a hard sell online anymore today in today's day and age, that's a tough sell. And, you know, I have marketing teams all the time that say, Hey, Sean, maybe you should stop talking about that. And I said, I refuse to, I'll die on that sword if, because that's the reality, right? We're trying to build it for the long term and build a foundation for the long term. And I think Drew, I think it's why we have so much success within our group is because our group buys into that three to five year plan. And ultimately by doing that, stacking those assets, they can look back five years from now and say, holy crap, look what we built. And now we've got a lot of those, you know, we've got our, our 1% club and we've got, you know, we've got almost 60 people in that club right out of the gate. That's being in the top 1% of their market, right? That's a, that's a, that's a, that's hard to do. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because people will take the long-term approach and by taking the long-term approach, you make different decisions, right? And you make, you make better decisions in my opinion, because you know that you're going to stick with that decision for the long term, right. right? You're in it, you're in it for the long haul. So you're, you invest in the things that you might not get an immediate return on, but you know, over time, you're going to get, you know, you're going to get an exponential return on. And so yeah. it's, uh, I think that that's a, I love hearing that, that, thought is and that that process is still out there alive and and well and uh you know that that we have people still you know latching on to that's why I, that's why i always say i love our communities because it's just built of people like you right they're like hey i'm okay with the i'm okay with build, building something solid for the long term yeah yeah i'm i'm super and i'm super fortunate like i have to say this too i think i'm in a situation where my w2 uh the company i work for interclips i love working for them you know i don't i'm not building this to get out and, and run away. I'm almost in my mindset, I'm adding another piece to the puzzle um, in that I love working here. I love what we're doing, what we're, what we're growing as a team. But then I look at, well, I can also build a legacy for my children. I've taken them down to the property. I'm showing them like, hey, I'm writing a thank you note because I want the customer to understand how much their business means to us. So when we write a thank you note for them, when they sell a piece of cook, you know, a cookie or a lemonade cup, they're, they're making these connections. And it's to me a selfish like way or not selfish, but a genuine way to like give them a reference point on, oh, wow, dad and mom are taking this firewood down to this home so that they can create the experience for these guests. And they see I show them the reviews I'm like these five star reviews are what keep the flywheel going. And it's just creating conversations that if I wasn't investing in doing it, I'm just sort of like that guy laying on the couch, like, Hey, you should go work out. You know, that, yeah. that, that doesn't resonate sometimes because kids are so smart. To totally. Right. It's like, you, you've got to be able to lead by example and for them to show it. And the thing I love about the short term rentals, and I've been investing for 24 years, I've invested in a lot of different asset classes, not just short term rentals. I've been in short term rentals since 2006. But in the early days, I, I invested in a lot of different asset classes. 
This is the only asset class I've personally ever been involved in that actually will gain the attention and keep the attention of kids at a very young age, right? And, mm -hmm. and so, because there's a lot of fun aspects to it, but they learn some amazing lessons along the way and of what it takes on the hospitality side, how to market, how to create these great experiences, why and how we get rewarded for that or not rewarded if we don't do a good job. And they start to really understand the business aspect of things, which is when you can learn in a fun environment, which I think that these, these t assets do that, like my kids are 13 years old, wanting to buy their next asset, right? And they're they're saying, I wanna buy our asset. They've been saving up. We, we were trying to buy one last year with them. And I told them if they saved up half of their down payment, I would partner with them on the other half. And they've got almost $28,000 saved up, not from mom and dad, but they, they've been around this for a long time. They've grown up around it. And they're like, man, we want to buy one now. I said, well, if you wanna buy one, you gotta to get to work. So it's been a few years for them to do that. But- yeah. They put their money together. They have a reason to save. They want to do it. And, and you create these different disciplines along the way. And, and I think it's really fun because it keeps their attention and they have they have fun with it. And I think you're seeing that with your kids. Totally. Yeah, my, my kids are seven and five. It's early stages for them. But, I mean, I don't think there's an early enough time to start teaching the right thing and them seeing the sweat equity being put out. And it's, it's a fun experience for the family. What we did learn last week is don't uh, go to work hungry. <laughs> we're all hungry. Yeah. Went to the Everybody's cabin. Hungry. <laughs> we're just fighting each other. Uh -huh. But uh, next next go around, we're going to take them to the caverns. We're going to take them to the surrounding amenities. We're going to yeah. basically use them for valuable reasons. It's like, let's go check everything out, have fun, document it. Let's create part of the guidebook experience. So I'm learning as, say, the leader uh, as where to position my teammates for being successful 100. and it's not it's not go hungry and chop firewood with my five-year-old because he's not he's not going to last very long no no exactly it's it's <laughs> an, it's picking pick, picking and choosing your battles right it's like being a good yeah. coach right if if everybody's exhausted for the day you know not not always the best time to have a second practice right and so no. you're, you're you're, you're just kind of, you have to pick your spots and it can be a lot of fun. And so, so tell me, we yeah. didn't even talk about the area. How'd you choose the area? Where'd you guys end up? Where'd you end up going? Yeah. So uh, great. Appreciate the question, Sean. Um, I was, you know, when I got into uh, Vodacy, it was kind of a gift and a curse. You guys give so much good information. We got access to air DNA, you know, the highest advanced plan, like I was like a kid in the candy store. I'm looking at, I'm looking at, you know, markets in Illinois and markets in Minnesota, markets in Florida, Georgia, everywhere, just because you have so much access to data. And it's like fun, you know? So maybe the first month or so, I'm just kind of like kicking around like, wow, this is so cool. I can see all these things. And I mean, I got close to being under contract in Florida. I got close to being under contract in Georgia, you know, the northern Georgia, kind of near Cherry Lock, the, uh, uh, that area, Tennessee, I've got family in North Carolina, and I just, I was almost into Deep Creek, which is a unique lake mountain type of setup in the Maryland mountains. And then as I started getting close to that, landing the plane with a property and going under contract, uh, I realized, I think for my very first one, I want to be at least within driving distance just to get used to the, you know, the, the process. And I've always said in, in business, uh, learning from one of my mentors that says you can't expect what you are not able to inspect. And yeah. so for me, if I'm going to hire, say, a property management team, I'm going to, you know, off sort of third party this thing, I got to be able to inspect it. And so I want to go through this process, understand what my reference point is for what right looks like you know i can't look at it and say just hands off forget about it and expect everything to work out that's not the way i operate i like to be pretty involved until i can really trust the the value of, of who's supporting me and so the shenandoah valley i always knew you know driving from washington dc to Asheville, where my mom lives and grandmother and uncle uh, it's beautiful you know you go down highway 81 you're just seeing the Blue Ridge Mountain for days. It's it's an amazing view if you've not driven down there. And it's one of the most popular national parks in the region. And Washington, D.C., knowing where that's where I live in, in this area, it's a very quick 
90 minute to two hour drive uh, west. And so a lot of people will just take a weekend trip, take a three or four day excursion. They're going hiking. There's some small skiing mountains nearby. So I knew the, the market itself was strong um, in a sense and that it was somewhat close to me, about two and a half hours from my house. And uh, I wanted to make sure I hit a performing property, one that's got uh, you know proven past performance. I wanted to have views like I got close to actually buying a few properties that didn't have the long range views. And it would have been a total deviation from my original thesis of I think that's the type of stuff that you can't like you can't lift and shift the house and get a better view. Sometimes if you don't have the view, if you don't have the waterfront, you got to have something that separates. And so it's got the long range view of the mountains. It's got the hot tub. It's got the proven past performance. And just a lot of those little boxes had to be checked for me to get serious because I knew the biggest variable to my success or our team's success in the first one, first property, was going to be me because it's my first one. So I got to take care of all the other variables and make those as sure as possible because maybe the next one I can take a bigger risk. Yeah. I can go cheaper in a less defined area because now I know what right looks like. But I'm the liability the first purchase and I kind of really bought into that. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, I think it's really like really good, right? We get better and better as, the, as we follow a process. I always say that, that the heart, the first one's the hardest one, right? And mm -hmm. you, you mentioned kind of being, having access to a lot of information is a blessing and a curse. Like I totally agree with that, right? The sadness comes from like a lack of perceived options. Like we don't have any options. We're pretty, we're pretty sad. We're down, we're, we're depressed. But anxiety comes from having a lot of options and not knowing if we're going to choose the right one or not, right? Because none of them are right. perfect, right? And so as you go, as you navigated those areas, and I always tell people, because I know that's going to be the case, I always say, just pick an area that you want to go, that you're familiar with, that you guys love the vacation in. And it, it seems like at the end of the day, that's where it kind of, that's where it kind of revolved back to. But then it also what it also aligned with your property goals of wanting to manage this and be very involved and be really hands on right that that's a little harder to do if it was you know in, in georgia or in florida because it's just going to be a lot lot longer drive for you to do that and so right. I, you know so i think having very clear property goals to be to help with that be kind of the north star guiding light when you make those decisions are decisions that a lot of people take for granted and they don't think about the long-term implications of that when they're looking at all these different areas. And I think that's important to always go back to that, which you did. And I think that's great. And I commend you for that because a lot of people, that's hard to do. That's harder. It's easier said than done for sure. When you're looking at all these different options, right. And, yeah. and second guessing your every move on your first one, which you are going to, because like you said, you feel like, Hey, I'm the liability here, right. I've, <laughs> I've never done this. Totally. Yeah. I, I was totally a, a self-aware, if you will. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. And, and so, so when was, so we, we ended up under contract, Tell, walk me through kind of the purchase, the setup, the launch, and how we're looking with things right now. Yeah, I'll tell you, lesson learned. Um, I should have gone through the full Vodacy program, the, the training and everything, at least one time yeah. before I started getting serious on making offers. I think I got, I got you know excited, you get to the beginning stage, it's like stage three slash acquire. Yeah. You start getting like, okay, I can analyze a market and you see a house, you're like, boom, this one's the one, I'm gonna go after it. Well, before you know it, oh, there's an offer going out. Oh, they're accepting it. Well, <laughs> I gotta go look at, uh, you know, a uh, launch. Like, yeah. So there was a lot going on, right? And I had not done that due diligence of, of running through the program first. I would have done that first. Um, uh, the process of getting to uh, property under contract, uh, Jacob was really helpful in helping me review a multitude of properties. I almost went under contract in North Carolina back in January. Jacob helped me tremendously because he actually, ha actually has a property in the same market. And I went and visited it. It just didn't have that long range view. House was fine, property great, but it didn't give you that wow factor. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I backed away. You know, I almost went on a contract off market and then I started almost doing a condo in Florida and uh, just continue kind of chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, making offers. 
And so I go under contract here in Stanley, Virginia, which is just south of Luray, Virginia. And that's yeah. basically uh, one, I think it's the fifth largest underground caverns in the whole world. Um, it's a really beautiful, unique space. Shenandoah Valley, Skyline Drive is kind of the most beautiful, like picturesque drive around the Blue Ridge Mountains. We went on a contract in early March uh, from a, a current owner that had other properties in the area. He, I think, kind of leveled up and invested in a larger property. And so this one's still successful, but he needed the cash to get, end up finishing the other project. So it's actually been great. He and I are still in contact. I, I worked closely with him from, from a sell, seller buyer standpoint. He's super helpful. We did a nice transition between uh, his, his bookings that were in place already. Um, lesson learned there. I mean, it's a very kind of tenuous process that, that could go haywire um, from a, just a guest experience standpoint. But we go under contract, um, had a great realtor, super helpful. Um, and that was in late or no, early March. The thing that I didn't expect is the inspector and the appraiser were some of the slowest like people to get their work done. Mm -hmm. But we were still on this timeline yeah. from a financing standpoint. <clears throat> and I'm like, uh, you know, how is this all going to work out? Right. Right. So we'll talk about that because your financing, you you navigated um, kind of a, an interesting navigation with financing using HELOCs and credit cards and everything else. Let's talk a little bit about that because that's a very unique approach to was that out of like wanting to do that and capitalize on some of that stuff or that you had in place, like you mentioned early on that you put that HELOC in place early on, knowing that you were going to invest. So I know that that was strategic. Um, talk to me about the credit cards or was that a necessity because financing there was issues or hiccups with it, or let's talk a little bit about that. Honestly, a great question. I think it, it was all tied to seeing a, a thesis play out in terms of, seeing a lot of people online talking about, you know, 0% financing. Okay. Well, how does that work? Like, what are you talking about? Money, money's not free. I, yeah. I've helped run a business. I've helped, you know, get lines of credit, all the things. And around the time I got involved with Vodacy, I got involved with a, a person uh, who's great, uh, Marcus Bayek uh, for Matrix, Matrix Mastery. And he helped me understand the way you sort of credit card stack. And essentially what you do is, uh, you know, you set up a business, get a lot of credit, usually on a credit card. A lot of these companies like you may have on your personal side or even business side, they want to incentivize us to get into these programs. And they bank on the fact, in my opinion, of folks that can't manage yeah. their spending habits. Yeah. So they're, they're predatory in a sense. But for me, I'm very capable or I guess able to to not spend, and, you know, hold myself back and, and whatnot. So. I'm the worst customer for them because uh, I'm not going to get myself in a situation that's untenable. And so long story short, first credit card, let's say it was $25,000, you know, credit line. Well, you can go through a process where you liquidate that card and you can liquidate up to usually 80, 90% of the total balance. And now you've got a balance that is 0% for whatever the introductory period is. So if you do multitude of those cards, let's say you do six or seven, each of them are 15, 20 some odd thousand dollar credit line, you liquidate them. Now you settle into a 0% interest payment, you're paying 1% of that total balance. So imagine you've got a $200,000 uh, credit card balance. Well, that's really gonna be a $2,000 payment per month because that's 1%, that's the minimum payment usually on a credit card. Well you can see there's a cliff coming, right? That introductory period is going to happen and you're either going to fall off and become 19, 20, 25% interest, or you got to do what's called a tr credit transfer where you get the next card and you transfer the balance over there into the 0% interest rate into a new card. And I've even done in some situations where if you prove with a credit card company or say a bank, that you're reliable, you know, that you pay that amount down, they'll end up giving you a new card and you can combine the two limits together and get the opportunity to have 0% for that total balance. 
So even though that old card, say, has run out of its introductory period, you now get to combine that amount with the new card. So instead of it being 20% or 20,000 here and 20,000 here, just make it 40,000 and they'll give you, they'll honor the introductory period for the full balance. So right now what I decided is that that's a process that takes a lot of steps. And it just like me being my first time with uh, the short-term rental investment, this has been my first time going through that stacking process. So there's a lot of things I would have done differently and timed it better, which I'll do going forward. And so I knew by the time we're getting close to closing on the property, that credit card strategy wasn't going to actually come to fruition. It's happening now. So I needed to pull the release valve and use the HELOC. Right. And so the HELOC allowed me to close on the property. And now I'm paying back the HELOC by creating a loan between myself you know, as a, as an individual with my wife and a loan agreement with the LLC where I'm a member. You know, so there's two separate identities there. My LLC is paying back my personal HELOC in, with interest included. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, and I, I, we, we navigate the same thing. We do that with the, the credit card stacking. I don't teach it or talk about it a lot because I do think that there's a significant amount of discipline that you have to have to do it. And you can yeah. very quickly get yourself into trouble. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it's, it's, I, I always, I'm always interested because it is, but it's really powerful if you're very disciplined, like you said, I'm, I'm their worst customer too. Right. With, and, and we typically, um, I mean, we, we, we spend millions of dollars a year because we're running all of our businesses on it and, mm -hmm. and imagine the points and the introductory rates and the things that we're able to get, on those cards, like we're, we're, we get some really good benefits from that, but it is a, it's very disciplined and you have to be very careful not to, like you said, you can eventually you fall off the cliff and they, they allow those programs because the majority of people do not do it and they're not yeah. navigated the way that we do. Yeah. hundred percent. And, and I think I had that realization when I saw the numbers, you know, growing in the balance, I was like, wow. I could really screw this up. You can. And and that's why like I, I'm really careful not to not to go promote it or talk about it too much. But there's mm -hmm. there are people that do and they understand how to do it. What was the what was the gentleman's name that you mentioned that you, you learned it from? Uh Marcus Bayak. Mark, He's Mark, uh yeah, Marcus B A E K. He's been great. Yeah. You know, super accessible, super clear on like this bank is interested in supporting this one's not, oh, this needs to be like your LLC needs to be in the state of this bank. Yeah. And just kind of knows that, that, that element of the world. And um, it, it's good to, you know, I've learned also through my marathon running days that I hit a wall of being able to DIY things. And this goes back to why I made the investment with Vodacy. I made an investment with a coach and ended up being able to qualify for the Boston Marathon which I had never been able to do by myself because I just kept hitting the wall. Yeah. And by paying for the coach, paying for the program that's going to you know accelerate your understanding and abilities, you can make it happen. And yeah. so I've, I've just kind of taken this mindset the last four or five years of, you know, there's no extra credit for doing it all by yourself. Yeah. And there's, there's exactly. like, I, I, I'm very happy that I don't have that sort of, um, what's the term that affliction of like, I got to do this all by myself and no one can help me because that's going to show I'm weak. Like, no, I'm the first one to be like, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. Right. That's uh, I love, I love the line of there's no extra credit for doing it yourself. That's, that is so true. And I spend a small fortune every year on coaches to this day and, and always have always will just because there's, you know, there's no, there might as well shorten the learning curve. We might as well accelerate our progress. And my goal is, and I think with most of the coaches out there, our goal is the same is we want to pass that baton, right? We want to be able to not only get you where we, to where we're at and what we've done, but be able to do go beyond what we've done. Right. And, and that's what a good coach is there to do is to help you even do more than they've ever been able to do, because you didn't have to go through the stumbling blocks and the time that, that like, like for me in the short term rental game that I had to go through since 2006, right now, mm -hmm. somebody else can progress a lot faster than I was ever able to. And, and I love it. I love seeing that a good and I've got great mentors that are the same way where and, and business coaches and they're like, hey, listen, you, you know, like you said, there's no extra credit doing it yourself. So you might as well run as fast as you can through what I did and not have this stumbling blocks and not have the, you know, the challenges that we had to, to go through and figure out on our own and then take that baton and go even further. And so it's, it's awesome.
And so how, how is the launch going? How's the, uh, we got the, got the property, we're navigating, you know, moving that money around. I appreciate you sharing that. It's very, you, it's very like a unique way to do it. And we don't talk about it a lot, um, but it is probably a little more common than people even realize that mm -hmm. again, takes a lot of discipline. And so if you feel like you're that disciplined person, might be something to look into. If you feel like you're, you, you're even flirting with not being able to pull it off discipline wise, don't do it because it's a, it's oh. a cliff that is, it's a, a steep cliff and it can be, it can be devastating. hundred percent agree. Um, you know, I'm always happy to, to share my experience with anybody. If there's anyone out there want to chat, like, Hey, reach out. I'm there. Um, cause people are, have given me so much of their time yeah. with nothing attached to it. So I want to be the same way and sort of lift as I'm trying to climb, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, in terms of how the launch is going, I really bought in. I think there's a there's a thesis that you have to buy into on. I see a lot of times out there, you know, in the Facebook groups and the in the various, I would say, like complaining boards more than anything, how you know short terms are dead or Airbnb is terrible or this that and the other. And I think people go into it almost with like an entitlement mentality that, well, I have a house and I'm putting it on this OTA. And it should perform because I love my house and my house is great. And like, why would no one else like it? And I don't know, it just, I don't know how to explain it, but you can kind of feel when someone's professionalizing a, a, a property or if they are looking at it as like a side thing that they, they are sleeping on the couch while they're sleeping in the room. And it's just not, it's just a little bit of a nuance. And so I really bought into your recommendation on look at it long-term you know, reduce cost to get in those first, you know, 10 five star reviews as fast as you can. So I got launched in May, May 6th of this year. So two months ago and just went head down as fast as I could get as many people in there as possible. I only had two people stay in there that were sort of like family friends. Mm -hmm. And that was, they stayed there within the first four days of launch because I wanted to get people in there immediately. So what I did, because I've learned that Airbnb, my opinion, sort of downgrades the experience if they see it as like a discount stay. Um, and I give the promotional 20% off the first three stays. But I ran the whole, I, I, let, I was like, hey, Sean, stay at my property, pay the full amount, pay the fees, pay the everything. And then I'll reimburse you on the backside from a, from a company standpoint. But I don't want Airbnb to look at this transaction as anything other than a normal, yeah. you know, run of the mill transaction. And so uh, was very, very hardcore on getting those first 10 reviews as fast as possible because Airbnb was going to review me on July 1st of this year to determine if I could get super host status. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, you know, there was three or four situations based on the learning curve I had to experience that caused me to maybe give a little bit of a refund, maybe accommodate the guest a little bit of, oh, my fan broke. I should have already had a backup there. You know, I'm going to give you a refund. I, I, I look at that five-star review in the beginning stages as an investment for the long term. So I was very, I'd say, aggressive on making sure I secured the five-star review. And even to the point where I had to refund one guest, the whole cleaning fee because I screwed up and my cleaning instructions on the refrigerator were carried over from the previous owner, but they were not in line with what's on the actual listing. And the ones on the refrigerator were way more stringent, like strip the bed, start the liner machine. And that was like, you're right. I, I was off base there. And um, he gave me a three star to start. But then we worked it out and he ended up removing the comment of the, the review altogether because he didn't want to screw me over. But I just explained to him, like, look, I'll give you the full you know, cleaning feedback. I don't care, but I need that five star. Right. And so he, uh, he agreed to it. But the other thing that was kind of tumultuous was within the first 10 days of launch, I ended up I had to uh, exit from the relationship I had with the third party property manager. Uh, my goal was sort of buying into the same the thesis that, that Vodacy preaches around uh, getting that professional property manager involved. And what I learned is really vetting that group more so than I did because it's not an easy button and they've got to be either at the standard that you're expecting them to be, or at least willing to come up to that standard. 
And I just learned over a few instances that my standards were just different than what, say, a group that's dealt with larger city in, uh, properties that maybe don't have as much of a, I got to, I got to pull guests from a smaller market. I got to really elevate this property and the experience. It's not an Austin or a Scottsdale or like, you know, large city that may just naturally introduce a lot of guest traffic. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I think your point of, I mean, it's really, you have to be really, really diligent when you're hiring property managers. I always say, like I preach, Hey, listen, I don't manage my own properties. I have full service property managers, but it is my least favorite part of the process is hiring them and finding the right mm -hmm. ones because we have a certain standards. And even to your point of saying, Hey, listen, they've either got to be at where mine are at, or they have to be willing to go to where mine are at. The problem with being willing to go is everybody says they're willing to go, but it's really hard to change human behavior. Right. And so their standards are their standards for a reason. So if their right. standards are at a 75 and mine are at a 90, then it's, they might say, Hey, I want to go to a 90, but they, then they fall right back to a 75, right? Because that's, that is where the standard lies. And so, yep. uh, you know, for us, we're not even look, looking for somebody that is willing to go to where we want to go. We need to find them, the, somebody that's already there. And that's hard. That's Great point. Really hard. Yeah. I personally like them. You know, like we had a fun time together. They actually flew in and visited the property with me for a day and a half and like went the extra mile. I was like, this is great. But then it comes down to like, I took your cherry log uh, listing mm -hmm. and basically said, Hey, when you build the listing, this is the level of quality I'm looking for in terms of describing, describing the rooms, describing the area, describing the attractions and just missed the mark, you know, by a mile. And so it was clear very quickly that, you know, I'm as involved with the guest messaging, with the, with the working with the cleaners. And it's like, there's too many people in this party right now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> let's, yeah. uh, let's bring it down. So, they, you know, it was a good learning experience and I made them whole and they treated me well. And I, I, you know, recommend them to work with other folks that might align with them, but I learned self-managing is something that I want to do, uh, for the near term one for just the material participation piece, but also, being able to know what right looks like for me, I'm, I'm really glad I'm doing the self-managing piece. Yeah, it's awesome. And, and you were telling me before we hit record that you're really enjoying it too, right? That's another yeah. piece of it too. Like it's because you're enjoying it, you're going to deliver a better experience. And, and I always, I always tell our members in our, in our mentorship program that if you're going to self-manage, don't self-manage just to save the money or mm -hmm. just to learn the market, right? self-manage if you're because if you don't enjoy it and it's a drag that's going to come across in your communication it's going to come across in your delivery and all of a sudden that standard you were trying to set actually starts to go down a notch or two with that customer experience because it's not something that you're enjoying but there's you know when you do enjoy you know getting that five-star review and hearing about the experience and and you love it as much you know that they're having a great experience as when you guys go use it you know, that's part of, you know, that's enjoying the process. That's enjoying being able to deliver that great experience. And when that's the case, there's, you know, you're, you're going to, again, raise the standard and keep that standard where you really want it. Today. Right. Yeah. It's, I feel I'm really motivated and really excited still because I, I still have not done like this goes back to if there's one thing I would change in the Vodacy program, I might put the acquire step at the very end right and make make everyone go through the beginning because i got yeah. so excited on the acquire stage it was like i still need to do professional pictures yeah i'm using the ones from the previous owner so they're not as updated i've got some of my own for my camera but i feel like i haven't i just haven't been able to do that yet because i'm like now in the in the thralls of managing it and so uh there's a lot of opportunities to still improve yeah. with the property get the right pictures i met with mike yeah. on the uh yeah. on the pick the lock uh stamp and got a lot of great ideas i just haven't haven't got haven't the artwork it. on the wall yeah. yet haven't done it so i'm going back and forth and like man maybe i should have waited and got it all airtight you know the first month month and a half then i thought well maybe I, i'll miss the kind of the, the the climb with the uh you know the, the popular time frame but probably six ways, half a dozen. Um, there's always a lot of, I think, an argument behind like pulling the ripcord, getting in there and, you know, maybe I knock off like block a week off here soon for that reason yeah. versus like waiting and, and like overanalyzing things. Cause 
sometimes you just got to get out there. Yeah, sometimes you just got to do it. And and to your point, and I think it's a great point. And and it might have been changed, but when you went through the course, it might not have been changed. But like the the very first like welcome lesson is like, hey, listen, go through the whole course <laughs> you said it. before you do it. So and it's yeah. but but the point is to to say, hey, listen, there's three major phases we're going to dial in here. Yeah, acquisition is the first one. But a lot of times, to your point, a lot of people do the acquisition phase and then they get to your point, they launch it. And then all of a sudden it's like, OK, I don't I'm not really like going through. I mean, we launched the property, but my setup was a little I didn't set it up the way that we talked about. I'm not marketing it the way we're talking about. And so I've got to kind of rewind and understanding that process of really being able to dial in and say, hey, listen, I've got to plan out to get to the finish line on all three of those phases if I really oh. want to maximize. Right. And so, yeah, yeah it, and it's because it. There's a lot of decisions you're making. There's a lot of time and effort <laughs> you're making when it comes to putting in executing on all that, right? And, yeah. And, and so, and it's hard once the property's already live, you're like, okay, do I take it off? I'm making money on the property right now. It's booked. If I take it off, I'm going to lose that money. But what's the trade off and how much am I going to maximize? And, and it's navigating those decisions. And I always think it's easier just to do it before you launch. I always tell people, like, try to get through, try to do all that stuff before you go live because it's hard to go back after. But there's like my cherry log. I, I bought the property in June and wanted to get through the rest of the summer and the fall foliage season, which is a big season there before I pulled it off and we actually did the revamp. Right. And so, mm -hmm. so we, we, but we, we said, okay, right from the beginning, we knew we were going to pull it off in November before the holidays, like in between the, the leaves fall off, fell off the trees by the end of October, we're going to block off the first two weeks of November and then we're going to put back on for the holidays. But we had that planned out and you may have to do the same thing on, on your property. It's going to be a very similar uh, kind of time frame decision on your your peak season. Your, your summertime, your fall is going to be peak in that area. And then you're going to have yeah. a little bit of a spot to do something. And then your holidays are going to be big again. I think that's smart. Uh, what you just said, I think I do need to just kind of identify that time frame block it off and work towards it instead of kind of being stressed about it, you know, week yeah. to week, it's kind of have a target and be driving towards it. Cause yeah, the fact you mentioned that piece about now I remember your welcome video, like go through the whole thing. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Whatever, okay. whatever. Sean, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to go. I want to dive in and buy something. <laughs> yeah. But it's so you're, you're spot on because I honestly haven't even gone through the maximizer uh, place yet. Like I, I, I know I need to, I'm like, I do that. I got to do that. But now I'm in the middle of, of managing it. So there's another use case of like, you should put me on there and say, just listen to Sean, please. Just listen. Right. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, that's, listen, it's, it's a process, right? And, and that's why we love having these conversations about the journey, because I think, you know, we don't know what we don't know on the first one. We don't know what we're diving into. And, and you realize there's a lot more to it than you think about in the very oh, yeah. beginning stages. And even when you're part of a mentorship and mastermind, there's more to it than you think about, even when you're going through it. Like even the maximizer today in our community, you know, Brian and Graham, they're posting their maximizer numbers. And you're like, man, these are like, they're getting like, you know, 10 to one return on ad spends. I think, I think Brian posted, he, he spent 39,000 or $3,900 for the year and has $42,000 in bookings from his, from wow. the direct bookings. So, it's like, and we haven't even scratched the surface there and you're not ready for that. You're, you're still right finishing up the launch. You're going to start to optimize and then maximize, right? But those are going to be the next steps. And so it, it's a really fun part of the process. It's fun to, to hear about this journey. I get super excited and stoked because as you know, great as you, you said, you know, the launch is going great. We're, we're having a lot of fun with it. We're doing our thing. There's still a lot more that you're going to have fun with and put in your pocket. And again, you're right in the thick of it right now, but there's still a lot of upside with this property. Totally. Yeah. It's, it's a unique place. It's a log cabin overlooking the mountains and beautiful. It's yeah. I, I'm so glad I sort of just took the jump and, and, and I'm in it. Uh, there's a 10 things that could have been done better, differently, et cetera. You learn from it, you move on. You, I like to say, you know, look through the front windshield, not the re rear view mirror as much as you can. Learn from it, obviously, yeah. but don't get tripped up twice where like you make a mistake and then you dwell on it and it beats you twice. I don't, exactly. I don't, I don't like that mindset. Uh, yeah. I always tell Wyatt that I coach him in basketball. I said, don't let one mistake turn into three or four, right? Mm -hmm. When you make a mistake, you move on and you go, you go, you keep playing the game, right? The game doesn't stop yeah. because we make a mistake. We make a mistake. We move on. Don't let one turn into five. Right. 
Right. Awesome. Awesome. Drew, this has been a great conversation. This is, uh, this is really, really fun for me to have. We're going to keep, you know, following this process, this journey. It's going to be a lot of fun at the end of these episodes though. I know we've shared a lot of kind of lessons learned. Is there something that comes to mind? If you could say, Hey, listen, I'm going to go back and I'm going to do this on my second time. I'm going to go back and give my younger self some advice. And, you know, is there anything that comes to mind of what you would, what you would give yourself some advice? Like our goal here is to help people walk into this game with their eyes wide open. And these conversations help people do that. And sometimes, you know, there's something that you're like, man, I wish I would have done that differently or wish I would have, you know, taken that step early on. Honestly, I think I go back to some of their other big plays I've taken over the years. Um, In 2020, I made a pretty big investment in 2021, 2022, made a couple of really big investments in the e-commerce space. And it was more of a, I'm going to give this big chunk of money to this group that I tr- trust because I think they're selling a good thesis. And, you know, it's more of a passive investment. Mm-hmm. Um, I wish I would have just taken the more active approach like I'm doing right now early on instead of thinking like, Hey, this group has a great pitch. It's going to be great. I'll, I'll hang back. I'll, I'll catch a check in the mailbox. And it's like getting ahead of this, of yourself a little bit. I, I wish I would have started here and then eventually use maybe some of this uh, money that's going to come in and, and success from this asset to be what makes the big play. I, I burned up a lot of cash, uh, that was great for a couple of years. And then the economy, you know, continued to, 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 uh, dry up. And, uh, I think, I, sh- I think this is like a foundation level mm-hmm. play that I wish I would have done this one first, uh, when I had a little bit more dry powder than when I did it now. And there was a lot more like finate, like kind of strategy of HELA credit card. I could have done the down payment with dry powder, had I done this one first versus sort of like the strategy that's still good. It just would have made things easier, I guess. That is to me. Um, I, I want to tell you this, that's one of my biggest lessons I've learned and it's not a common thing that I hear at the end of these episodes when I ask that question. Um, and all the advice is always great. I love listening to all the advice. One of the, my biggest lessons was, was just that, like, I think that the, the idea of passive income and giving your money to somebody or putting it into something and letting the checks roll in, I think that that's a, I think that that is a fallacy that is out there on the internet. That is not as, it's not as great as it sounds. Sometimes the, one of my rules of investing, right. I have my rules of investing in, um, uh, over the lessons learned along the years. One of the, my biggest rules right now is I will not give money to anybody. I want to be the general partner, the active decision maker on any deal that I do. We've been in a position where we have been the money partner, right. And where we say, okay, we're going to, we're going to fund the deal and let somebody else go do it. Whether it's a syndication, the, I, I was doing it on land deals and, it was it was the some of the biggest financial setbacks that we had and you know now even though we could fund deals i don't like i won't do a deal unless i'm the active partner and mm-hmm. because we make more active decisions i want to be have a more active role because good bad or ugly i know that i'm making the decisions with it and it's a very very interesting piece of advice and i really appreciate you sharing it because i have four different rules and that is one of them Right. And, and it is it is I'm not going to give my money and be the money partner on any deals. I will be the active partner on the deals. Mm. And, and yeah, it, and it's a hard lesson. <laughs> it is. And, it, and it's not a lesson that a lot of first time investors get themselves into. Right. A lot of times you're, you're forced to be the active par- partner. And so it's very interesting that that uh, that that is a, the you know, kind of a lesson that you learned along the way saying, hey, let that. I could have accelerated my progress. I could have accelerated into this game a little bit better had I not done that in the past. And I think that there's a, that's a, that's something to definitely think about. Not that there's bad deals out there, not that doing that is, it ends up being a bad deal, but I do believe it can be setbacks. And I do believe that there are times where you just don't control it. And when you don't control it, you're kind of at the mercy of whoever is controlling the deal on the success of it, the the failure of it, however, how it's going to perform. And for me, that is one of my top four, um, one of my top four kind of hard and fast rules is that I won't be the money on a deal. Like I'm going to be the active partner as much as we want that passive 
investment to just be mailbox money. It's uh, I think it's talked about a little bit more than the reality is of how that works out for a lot of people. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the last piece I'd mention is I've, in terms of like building the, the structure of the investment strategy, I, I failed to mention the, the life insurance cash value policy. That's sort of yeah. the foundation of all this. I wish I had probably started that to begin with. Yeah. Because what I'm doing is I'm actually borrowing mm -hmm. against that to pay off the credit cards and then replenishing the policy with the business funds. So it's allowing this sort of ebb and flow yeah. with the credit cards. You become more attractive to the, to the companies and I'm not affecting that life insurance policy. I'm just borrowing against it. So there's, there's a lot of cool stuff I'm learning. I'm, I'm just scratching the surface. I feel like some of those like bigger, more strategic uh, initiatives, but uh, you know, it's life is such a cool journey and, and um, you know, meeting people like you and others in the group has been great having that little extra, just like, Hey, this is how you do it. You know, th that's been great. And uh, looking forward to just continuing to grow with the team. Awesome, man. Well, listen, Drew, we're, we're excited to see where you're going to take all this. It's awesome. All the different strategies you're stacking to, to accelerate your progress. And, and it's really, really fun to be, have you as part of this community. Our con community continues to grow. Those of you that are listening, you know, I know you enjoy these conversations as much as I do, because we get feedback that these are our most popular episodes that we, that we put out. So as always, Drew, I really appreciate it. I really thank you for your time. I know that you come from your background with your dad being a preacher and your mom being a school teacher. You know, you've got that kind of that that teaching, giving background in, in, that's and then also like just so diligent with what you're doing. And so it's a, it's fun to see you execute. And I appreciate your time and willingness to share and let other people kind of listen in on this conversation. So thanks so much for joining us today. You got it, Sean. Appreciate the time. And uh, you guys come out to the D.C. area for a, for a meetup one of these days. I'll be there. Hey, we're, we're going to be there. I told you we, we were we we're trying to make it out to the, the northeast. Uh, we're coming. You, you, we're going to we're going to be out there here shortly. And so I'm Sounds not coming good. to DC in the summertime though. You gotta, I gotta hit you in the spring <laughs> or the fall. It's a little too, it's a little too, uh, too, a little, little to toasty out there and a little humid for me. Oh uh, yeah, you got it. <laughs> yeah. So awesome. Well guys, those of you listening, we very, very much appreciate your time. We know how valuable it is. And I love that you spend it with us. We hope you get value out of this. We hope that these episodes, there's a lot of takeaways for you. I know there are. And so if you know anybody else that would get value out of this, please share the show. Those things help us grow and spread the message and help other people walk into this game with their wide, eyes wide open. You know, I don't uh, run ads or sponsorships or anything else like a lot of shows do. And so you just uh, you, you, the only way that we grow is that if you share this. And so if you get value out of it, please share it. You like it. Thumbs up. Give us a review if you have more than 30 seconds on whatever platform you're watching or listening on. And the final most important thing I ask you at the end of every episode is to go pick that one thing you can do today to start building that life you don't want to take a vacation from. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Vacation Rental Revolution podcast. Share this with other people you think need to hear about it. And don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. Hey Grace, is there a website? Yes! For more amazing content and expert advice, visit bodicey.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode.